Welcome to Sorcery Steps, a series of episodes with people from around the world who are creating positive change and social impact. I am Luis Guilherme, and today our guest is Vicente Ramos, a Filipino economist who holds a Master of Public Policy degree from Hertie School, one of the world's leading institutions for public policy, international relations, and data science. Today, Vincent tells us what it's like to live in Berlin, his experiences at the Herd School, and essential tips for staying there. Uh, Vincent, thanks so much for our time and attention to this podcast. And at this moment, I to begin your conversation, I like to ask some questions. So, where are you from? What is your academic background? And why are you studying public policy? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Luis, for having me. I'm, I'm Vincent Ramos, and I originally come from the Philippines. Uh, so I was born and raised in uh, the capital city of Manila. And so it's uh, quite an urban uh, place, not a lot of green spaces. Uh, I went to a public school and uh, I did my bachelor's also in the Philippines, in the University of the Philippines. And I uh, studied economics for my bachelor's. And after I studied my, my bachelor's in economics, I worked for two years in the competition authority in, in the Philippines. So I was in the economics office there. And I knew that I wanted to do a master's degree after two years. So uh, even though, you know, it's a, there's a lot of like temptation. Like if you start to earn money, it's hard to, to, to leave that and to pursue, uh, pursue graduate school where you don't earn much, right? You earn student wages or you earn student salary. And, uh, But I wanted to pursue that because I feel like if I wanted to pursue a career in public service in the future or in a multilateral agency in the future, then at one point I would need a graduate degree, uh, a master's degree. And so when I applied for scholarships, I came across this Master's of Public Policy. Uh, it's a good applied social sciences uh, public policy program. And uh, uh, thankfully, I got accepted and now I'm about to I'm about to finish it. So. That's uh, my story in a nutshell, I would say. Vincent, which topics are you currently investigating and studying in Germany? That's actually a tough question because when I was um, in my doing the last part of my bachelor's, I was really into macroeconomics. I was really into macroeconomic policy. And so things like uh, foreign direct investments and growth and, uh, uh, of course, unemployment. So these broad macroeconomic indicators, cross-country kinds of studies. So that's one thing that I found really interesting. Uh, when I worked for the competition authority, uh, it, it became something else, right? It became more of like antitrust cartels, mergers and acquisitions. And it's also a different kind of a field of economics. It, it required a different way of thinking. And so I was thinking maybe if I do my master's, I'm going to do more competition related studies. But then now I'm uh, doing uh, my master's and I, for some reason, I ended up in labor topics. And so I'm now doing uh, more labor related topics, topics on unemployment, informal economy, and uh, also to some extent, innovation policy and how it affects labor markets. And so uh, I've been to different directions, different fields of economics, but right now I would say that the current field of interest would be or related on labor topics, labor issues. And for sure, at some point in the future, it might change. But at some point, uh, at this point, that's uh, what I would say I'm interested in. And Vincent, why did you choose Germany to pursue a master's degree in public policy? I am asking this question because I have some Filipino friends and they tend to go to other English-speaking countries such as Singapore, Australia, America, Canada. Some of them go to New Zealand as well. But why Germany and why the Herd School? Yeah. When I was applying for master's programs, I had two conditions. And also that applies to the, the, the programs that, that I applied for the PhD programs. There are two conditions. Number one, I didn't want to take a, a standardized test. I didn't want to take the GRE. 
And number two, I didn't want to take the IELTS or the TOEFL. So for uh, I'm sure this is something you're all familiar with. If you want to take a master's degree abroad, you have to take a graduate record examination office, uh, sorry, exam. And uh, it's, uh, it's something that you, you have to pay some, uh, I think it's like 100 euros or something to, to take that exam. Uh, that's also separate from you know, how you prepare for it. And there's also an IELTS exam to test your English proficiency, as if I cannot speak and understand English, and I have to prove to these, uh, to these schools that I know how to communicate in English. So I find that really frustrating. So that's uh, number one criteria for me. And so the only, and so that basically eliminates for me the U.S. That eliminates U.K. That eliminates Australia. Uh, and so I'm left basically with European or Asian countries. And that would give me Germany, Netherlands, Japan, Singapore. I think Singapore already requires it. I'm not sure anymore. Uh, but yeah, and so it narrowed down my choices to, to basically European countries. And I came across a scholarship offered by the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service. And uh, I applied for, for one of their scholarship programs, and thankfully I got in. Uh, in, their, in that scholarship program, I think they only had like six or seven schools accredited. And then some of them are located in different smaller places in Germany, like Passau and Erfurt. So these are more like smaller university towns in rural parts in Germany. And so when I saw the Terti school was in Berlin, Berlin is the only city that I know, and so I selected it. So it's nothing particular about the school, nothing particular about uh, Herty, but uh, it was later, only later that I found out that it had a good reputation among among uh, those who are taking public policy. And so by chance, uh, I ended up yes, here. Yes, unfortunately, I know Jerry, and I feel the same thing. It's quite expensive for us <laughs> here in Brazil as well. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, pretty expensive. And um, Vincent, could you tell us uh, our experiences at Heart School? Um, so the Heart School number one is very diverse. I think fifty percent of the of the students are international, and so fifty percent are Europeans and Germans. And so what I like about it is that. Uh, I get to meet so many people from so many different countries. And that makes, I think, the discussions more enriching. So there's no one dominant narrative of how to approach a certain policy problem, right? People can say that, oh, this works in my country. And then the other person would say, oh, no, this does not work in my country, uh, or this cannot work in my country. And so I find that quite interesting because it, 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 it emphasizes the, the fact that there's no one-size-fits-all policy. And uh, uh, even though we're all, even though it's quite a relatively progressive school with progressive students, um, there are also different degrees by which people want to approach problems. Like, for example, um, there would be people who would call for, uh, like in light of the Black Lives Matter issue in the U.S., right? There would be people calling for uh, defunding the police, right? Or, or, or removing resources to, to, to police institutions. And there are some students who are saying, you know, that's not going to work. That's not the right approach to do. And so it's, it's, a, it's a nice contrast. It's, it's a nice balance of opinions. And so it's a collaborative. The, the classes are mostly collaborative. And I like the, the atmosphere of just being able to, to talk freely about their opinions and really uh, speaking from experiences from their own countries and their own families. And so uh, I think that's one unique thing about Heritage School compared to other universities in Germany. It's that level of diversity. Let's imagine someone who is listening to us wants to study at the Heart School as well. Which tips for the application process and fielding would you give to this person? Mm, the, the, the first tip I would have is to have a clear statement of purpose, have a clear motivation of why you want to study public policy and why you want to study at the Heritage School. So it's not just really about public policy 
uh, as a field because literally you can come from a chemistry background or you can come from a journalism background and still connect it to the public policy because they all have some policy implications in it. But I think it's like, why do you, uh, why does, or why does a public policy program fit into your future career plans? And so that's something that I think applicants have to find out before they start applying. And that's something that they, they also should emphasize in their applications. Um, I think that establishing fit is something that's critically important. Um, there are things like grades and then uh, uh, exam performances. So these are all things in the past, right? We can't do things. We we can't do anything about them anymore. Um, but we, what we can do is to have a good statement of purpose and also find uh, referees, the the professors or or professional mentors who are willing to write a good recommendation letter for us, who will highlight our strengths. Uh, both academically and in in the in the work experience. So, I think those two things—a statement of purpose and a good motivation, uh, sorry, a good recommendation letter—would go a long way. I have two questions about the faculty. How is the relationship between the students and the professors? And my second question: What classes are like? Do you have more debates and few students, or lectures where? You can find more than 100 students, for example. How classes are like at the hair school? I would say that the professors are very receptive and they're very accommodating with the needs and the demands of the students. And of course, that has pros and cons, right? You want someone, you want a professor who has a certain command, uh, a certain commanding presence. Uh, but also a professor who's understanding of the needs of the students and of the feedback of the students. You know, if students are not learning from the approach of the professor, then that's something that you want to flag and you want to raise as early as possible. And that's something that I think Hurti professors are very aware of, right? They're really trying to seek feedback constantly and trying to improve their teaching methodologies constantly. And that's something that I appreciate. Uh, the classes, so it depends on the classes. Um, there are lectures that are required. These are for classes like economics and statistics. So you'd have a class of like 100 and 150 sitting in an auditorium, and you're gonna listen to an hours long to an hour long lecture. And so, uh, it's it's like your usual uh, it's like your usual lecture. And then there are also smaller classes. So when you take like specific electives already. Then you get to spend uh, more time with a smaller group of people. And then there are debates and group activities in these kinds of, of, of uh, classes. What I would say, though, is that there is uh, quite a lot of uh, heterogeneity in the students, in, in the students uh, of Herty School. There are, uh, quite, there are quite some students who are really competent and really, really good at their thing. Right, so they have good work experience, they have good academic experience, and so they come from this place of substance. And you'd hear them, you'd, you'd hear it from the way that they talk, and the, the, you hear it from the way that they present their arguments. And there are also some, of course, it's unavoidable, who would, who's just there to earn a degree, and who's trying to freeload on the, on the usually um, uh, very uh, studious students from developing countries. That of course happens, uh, <laughs> but definitely it's, it's present in in any school, anyways. But uh, I mean, this is graduate school, right? So we don't sweat the small stuff. And regarding the internships, what if someone wants to study and have some professional experience? Hert School offers work opportunities for its students. Have you already worked in your field while studying? If so, may you tell us about your experiences? Okay. Yeah. So an internship is a required component for the Herty School. So you need to have an internship in between your first and second year. Uh, unless, for example, you want to waive that requirement and you, because you, for example, you have, you have sufficient work experience, you can have that waived. But for, for most people, it's it's a requirement. And so the Herty School would, would also help students finding uh, 
finding some internships. And I was, uh, that internship period for my part was at the height of the pandemic. And so it's difficult to get internships. And so what I did was that I had that requirement waived because of my two-year work experience in the government anyways. But still, I found a student assistantship job. And there are quite a lot of student assistantship jobs in Berlin that people can find. And it's also easier because um, if you're an English speaker, if you're a non-German speaker, uh, the only city where you can find English opportunities would be in Berlin, right? There's no other German city where you would find, uh, you know, opportunities for student assistantships when you don't when you don't speak German. And so uh, I had two student jobs. The first student job was a teaching assistant job for an undergraduate economics class, and then the second job is I'm doing a student research assistantship job. For one of the for for one research fellow in a think tank here in Berlin, and uh, that experience I got that opportunity because that research fellow is mostly interested in the Philippines and in topics of indigenous peoples in the Philippines, uh, and it's one thing. And maybe because uh, I could understand the language, maybe that's one advantage I bring to the table. So. That's how I got the opportunity, but uh, th those are two two opportunities that I had the pleasure of, of of doing here in Berlin. Yes, I can imagine that. I I remember when I went to Heidelberg, which is a campus city, uh, a ki <laughs> a quite expensive campus city, mm -hmm. I may say, and most of the students use it to work in Frankfurt to because it's a place, it's a city where you can find more opportunities. And, well, uh, speaking about the students and stuff, most of your classmates at the Heart School are Germans or international students. Could you tell remarkable stories with them? Yeah, so I have 50% uh, 50 of the school are international students, and 50% are like Germans or other European countries. And so I think my closest friends would be some students from India and from Latin America, also because of some shared, I think, shared cultures, shared, uh, shared love for food, shared, <laughs> shared, uh, shared cultural backgrounds are, are also a factor. And uh, uh, I get along well with, uh, with, with these classmates of mine. Uh, but ultimately, I look forward to really having interactions with them in class, right? And trying to really understand their perspectives on issues. And uh, it's, it's, it's a good learning experience because there are things, there are funny things that, yeah, there are things that I now find funny, which I, I think should have been obvious to me. Uh, but... Uh, uh, but but are not. So I give you an example. Before I thought that all Indians don't eat beef, <laughs> and apparently I did forget that there's so much heterogeneity, and there's so much cross cross regional you know regional differences within India that you know in the north it's fine for them to eat something, and for the south they really don't eat something. Uh, and so it's uh it's it's. Yeah, it's it's problematic because you know I've had these stereotypes develop over over time, <laughs> and uh, for example, all Mexicans are Catholics. I had that uh, I had that uh, impression, and so when I met a, a Mexican who was not Catholic, I'm like, oh, that's cool. Uh, that's a first, and I didn't know you guys existed, and so uh, it really broadened my, I think, my worldview to some extent because you know I didn't have that much awareness before going to Berlin. So yeah, that's funny. <laughs> yes, um, everybody says everybody here in, in Latin America, but especially in in Brazil and Mexico, that Brazilians, Mexicans, and Filipinos are like cousins. I think they are brothers, uh, if you see uh, some cultural aspects, uh, it's very interesting. <laughs> but uh, Vincent, here, uh, speaking of Brazil, um, okay, I, I would say all Brazilians, but I think it's better to say most of the Brazilians believe that 
German public sector is efficient. Um, like uh, Germans, we have this image here. Uh, Germans are proud of paying uh, high taxes because they know uh, the public services are, are good in Germany. So if I pay taxes, I can study for free or I, I don't need to, um, like, I don't need to spend so much money as a student in, in America. So uh, we have this good image of the, G the German public sector here in Brazil and public sector which includes the public administration and also the public policies in in this European country. So um, what are the remarkable things you discovered in Germany that you did not know before arriving in Berlin? Uh, the, oh, the first thing that I realized is the, uh, the first thing I arrived here in Berlin in 2019, and at that time, there were still two airports in Berlin. And the uh, airport that I arrived at, which was called Tegel Airport, was like this, think of, think of it as like a warehouse. Think, think of it as like a, a, literally a, a, an, an old, dilapidated warehouse. It was functional, but it was small and inefficient in my opinion and so i was like is this is this europe and did i did i land in the right country uh and so i think one one of the uh one of the explanations that they had was that there was supposed to be a brand new airport in berlin the new berlin brandenburg airport which took almost 10 years to finish Right, so it was supposed to be finished. Uh, I think some six, seven years ago, and it got delayed and delayed and delayed, and finally it opened just late last year, in two thousand and twenty. And so finally, after like a decade of waiting, they now have this functional airport that is fit for a European city. But they attribute that long waiting line and those delays to public sector inefficiencies. Right, the the length of the, the time it took for permits to get approved, and for uh, I don't know for yeah for for the construction to finish and so on and so forth. So that's one, and I I thought to myself, oh, so not all not Germ Germany is not perfect about apparently, right? So there are still bottlenecks in the public sector, right? And you know, no government is perfect, sure, uh, definitely. But what, what, what is important to highlight is that um, uh, political participation in Germany is critical. And I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's evidence of a robust democracy, right? And so they can hold their leaders accountable. They're, not, they're, they're out of this personality politics mindset, right? That, that, uh, they don't like, they, they call out Angela Merkel for the things that she would do wrong. And they would, you know, they would commend her for the things that she would do right. And so they did not hesitate to praise her when she was handling the first part of the pandemic well. And they did not hesitate to condemn her and to, to criticize her when Germany was not doing well sometime early, earlier this year. And so that's one thing that's holding, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's also one thing that was, uh, what do you call that? That's one of the reasons why her current political party, right, the CDU, is now uh, getting lower and lower support in the polls, right? And so you'd see that shifting public opinion in, this, in response to government's actions. And uh, I think that's a sign of a healthy democracy when uh, leaders are held accountable for their decisions and for their actions. Uh, and so that's one thing that I also admire about at least the German public uh, administration system and there are also s small things like i don't know registering for your home in the local mayor's office uh and things like that of course it takes time and you have to do it a lot a lot of paperwork and like manual paperwork and sending it by post and uh, not by email and so these are these are minor things but uh 
you'd think that Germany is this uh, 21st century digitalized public sector, not the bureaucracy. Not yes, I um, in my it's like Japan. I, I in, in my another podcast I spoke with um, uh, a researcher who studied at the Kyoto University in Japan, and he mentioned a very similar thing. So I have to print all the articles, all the investigations, all the homeworks, and give to the professor. So uh, bureaucracy, bureaucracy, and bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> and this is yeah. um, my yeah there was a language barrier language yeah. barrier is a yes, real I, yes I can imagine that <laughs> um, like German uh, I, I have a friend who always say that life is so short to, to learn German <laughs> yes personally I, I, I like I, I like German I like German language, but I, I think the, the grammar is tricky. It's tiresome to learn. Uh, even even though I, I I speak Portuguese, which is a Romance language, um, I mean, the Romance languages, their grammars, if you see French or Spanish, it's, it's tiresome, but German grammar is in a different level. <laughs> But um, well, uh, in in your yeah, definitely. So, some minutes ago, in your your conversation, uh, I told you that uh, Brazilians and the Filipinos and Mexicans are like cousins, or me, maybe brothers. We are more warm. We are, or we tend to be friendly toward everyone. And it's not our image that we have here. I, I have great experiences with Germans, but we have some stereotypes here in, in Brazil. So Germans are more strict. They are close. Uh, they are not uh, like open toward foreigners or international students. So I'd like to ask you, Vincent, have you faced any tough times during your studies in Germany? And could you describe what you did to overcome them? So, yeah. So I knew that the first part of the... that the adjustment phase would be the hardest, right? The adjustment phase, the, really the first few weeks, eh, the first few weeks are the hardest because it's the time that you get homesick a lot and it's the time that you feel like you know no one. And so I made sure that even before I went to Berlin, I tried to find friends and language partners language like lang tandem language partners who I can meet in Berlin who and who I can ask questions in Berlin and so that's the first thing that I did I think the reason why I didn't encounter that much difficulties here in Germany is because I really prepared for it in the best way that I can and I mean emotionally physically financially etc because I don't want to be caught by surprise that, oh, at this point, I have to like open a, open a mobile phone contract. But I know that to open a mobile phone contract, I would need someone who would speak German. And so I'd need a friend who would, willing, who would be willing to accompany me to open a mobile phone contract. And so th these are the th things that I tried to settle first, even before moving to Berlin. Um, you're absolutely right. The Germans have this image, this um, this uh, this reputation of being like closed and not so warm and uh, being very direct. And to some extent, that is true, uh, especially if our benchmark is uh, Filipinos and Brazilians and Mexicans and Indians. So of course, there's really a cultural difference. Uh, so when you talk to them, they're not even smiling, and I'm like, why? Why would, why would you smile? You know, what's wrong with you? And uh, but it, you know, they don't mean to be rude, but it's like it's it's their upbringing, and as long as they are respectful uh, with what they say and how they say it, so I try to be be open to that, and I don't always I don't have this impression that um, because I smile or because I'm because I'm 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 warmer or you know uh latinos latinas are warmer 
then they're nicer people you know it's not necessarily true of course and uh yeah so definitely just really learning to adapt to these different cultures and try to uh, really see the good in people well uh many people went to study abroad so I have many friends, I, and I'm sure you have many contacts, friends, acquaintances who also went to study abroad. I think because the people want to explore the world, we are more connected. So people are more willing to explore other cultures and obviously are more open and more curious about uh, opportunities to, to study abroad. So what you do say to those people who went to study abroad go for it the, the first thing is uh don't delay it go for it i have a friend i have friends who uh also have this idea of i want to study abroad and that friend of mine was saying that since 2017 and it's already 2021 at some point you have to send out those applications right it has to be done and if you fail this round, then apply next round and apply next round. That's the first thing that I think people should keep in mind is that you're not going to get these offers out of nowhere. You have to really start applying at some point. And you, it's something that you need to make a timeline for yourself, right? And only you can control the timeline. And I say this quite with a, uh, with, with some conviction because... Uh, uh, it it takes it takes it takes discipline to 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 quit whatever you're doing, either you're you're doing a current job or you're uh, you're pursuing a, a break or, or or you're doing your passion, but you know that at some point you want to go to grad school, then you know uh, just tr just try applying. Competition is getting tougher and tougher each year, each cycle. And it's a, it's a fact of life that we all have to deal with. Uh, India is getting more and more competitive. China is getting more and more competitive. Uh, also getting more and more international. And so competition is going to get tougher and tougher each year. And so this is not, uh, this is not to like burst anyone's bubble, but uh, apply to as many universities as you can, as possible, especially because in European schools i think the admission or sorry the application fee if there is any application fee is cheap compared to applying for say the us or the uk but the point is know your targets and start applying immediately because other people will uh send these applications and will get admitted but would have problems with scholarships and you know, it's it's uh sometimes you get a scholarship but you don't get the school, or you get the school but you don't get the scholarship, and so these are uh, these are different. These are uh, it it can complicate the whole process, and so uh prepare in advance. Prepare in advance. I have a friend who wants to get uh to uh, to start masters this September. And wants to do a wants to get a scholarship, right? Now he messaged me uh, on Facebook around the first week of May. <laughs> the first week of May this year, messaged me, "Hey Vincent, are are, are scholarships uh, are there are, are there still positions open and scholarships open for this school year? And you know, if you're if you plan to enter uh, the master's program in September of 2021, then your starting date." of application is june or july the previous year right or 2020 and uh it's it's a long process with a lot of steps that one has to do and so of course what did i tell that friend uh okay we can try these last minute applications but most probably they're all gone the, the, the slots are all gone and so this could have been prevented with some you know prior research beforehand so what I would advise people is, number one, do your research beforehand. Number two, apply to as many universities as you can and uh, as many universities as possible. And number three, just start. Uh, don't delay it, just start. If you get in and you don't want to do it, then defer. But at least you got an offer. And then uh, you, you decide when, the, when you cross the bridge. So uh, Sorry, you cross the bridge when you get there. That's what I wanted to say. So yeah. Thank you. 
I would like to thank you for joining us today, Vincent. It's great to have this opportunity to hear about your inspiring experiences, and I hope more people will study in, in Germany. Mm-hmm. And thank you very much for listening to this episode. Recommend this podcast for your friends, and if you understand Portuguese, don't forget to check The Green Steps, my podcast, my another podcast, where I speak with environmentalists from Brazil. You can find the entire series of episodes on my website, luisguilhermenemel.com. The link is in the description of this episode. We will have another conversation on some. Awesome.